Greetings everyone, welcome back. We're going to complete our uh, video series on the Eucharist. So this is part three of that series and we're going to look at the recipient of the Eucharist. So how and when you may receive and also we'll be looking at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So we'll get right into it. The recipient of the Eucharist, threefold manner of communicating. So there are three ways of receiving communion. That the faithful may learn to be zealous for the better gifts, they must be shown who can obtain these abundant fruits from the Holy Eucharist. Um, it must be reminded that there is not only one way of communicating, that is of receiving. Wisely and rightly then, did the, our predecessors in the faith, as we read in the Council of Trent, distinguish three ways of receiving this sacrament. Some receive it sacramentally only. Such are those sinners who do not fear to approach the holy mysteries with polluted lips and heart, who, as the Apostle says, eat and drink the Lord's body unworthily. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 and 29. Of this class of communicants, St. Augustine says, He who dwells not in Christ, and in whom Christ dwells not, most certainly does not eat spiritually his flesh, although carnally and visibly he press his teeth, with his teeth the sacrament of of his flesh and blood. Those therefore who receive the sacred mysteries with such a disposition not only obtain no fruit therefrom, but as the apostle himself testifies, eat and drink judgment to themselves. So that is if you are either unbaptized or in a state of mortal sin and you still go up and receive communion, you are said to be receiving sacramentally only, but that in itself constitutes a grave sin. And as Saint uh, Paul says, you eat and drink judgment to yourself if you do that. So that is receiving sacramentally only. Others are said to receive the Eucharist in spirit only. This is also called spiritual communion. They are those who, inflamed with a lively faith which worketh by charity, partake in wish and desire of that celestial bread offered to them, from which they receive, if not the entire or at least very great fruits. So that again, if they are unable to be physically in the church um, or for whatever other reason, if they're in the church, but they cannot, they cannot go up and receive, uh, they can receive our Lord spiritually through spiritual communion. And as it says, that, uh, there are also many graces to be obtained from that. And lastly, there are some who receive the Holy Eucharist both sacramentally and spiritually. Those who, according to the teaching of the Apostle, having first proved themselves and have and having approached this divine banquet adorned with the nuptial garment, derive from the Eucharist those most abundant fruits which we have already described. Hence it is clear that those who, having it in their power to receive with fitting preparation the sacrament of the body of the Lord, are yet satisfied with, the spiritual, with a spiritual communion only, deprive themselves of the greatest and most heavenly advantages. Okay, so then when you... Uh, are in a state of grace and receive appropriately, you are said to receive sacramentally and spiritually. And that is the ideal for receiving communion. Necessity of previous preparation for communion. We are now come to point, uh, sorry, we now come to point out the manner in which the faithful should be previously prepared for sacramental communion. To demonstrate the great necessity of this previous preparation, the example of the Saviour should be adduced. Before he gave to his apostles the sacrament of his precious body and blood, although they were already clean, he washed their feet. In John chapter 13. To show that we must use extreme diligence before Holy Communion in order to approach it with the greatest purity and innocence of soul. In the next place, the faithful are to understand that as he who approaches thus prepared and disposed is adorned with the most ample gifts of heavenly grace, so, on the contrary, he who approaches without this preparation not only derives from it no advantage, but even incurs the greatest misfortune and loss. It is characteristic of the best and most salutary things that, if seasonably made use of, they are productive of the greatest benefit. But if employed out of time, they prove most pernicious and destructive. It cannot therefore excite uh, our surprise that the great and exalted gifts of God, when received into a soul properly disposed, are of the greatest assistance towards the attainment of salvation, while to those who receive them unworthily they bring with them eternal death. Of this the Ark of the Lord affords a convincing illustration. Uh, 
people of Israel, that, that refers to sorry, the Ark of the Lord, there is the Ark of the Covenant in the, New, in the Old Testament. The people of Israel possessed nothing more precious and it was to them the source of innumerable blessings from God. But when the Philistines carried it away, as described in 1 Samuel uh, chapters 4 to 5, uh, when the Philistines carried it away, it brought on them a most destructive plague and the heaviest calamities, together with eternal disgrace. Thus also food, when received from the mouth into a healthy stomach, nourishes and supports the body, but when received into an indisposed stomach, causes grave disorders. Oh, here it gives the, ana uh, the analogy of indigestion, that even if the food itself is good, if you're, if you're eating on a sick stomach, uh, it will cause more harm than good. So it's the same with the Eucharist. Uh, that you have to be in a state state of grace but to receive. Preparation of soul. The first preparation then which the faithful should make is to distinguish table from table. This sacred table from profane tables. The celestial bread from common bread. This we do when we firmly believe that there is truly present the body and blood of the Lord of whom of him whom the angels adore in heaven at whose nod the pillars of heaven fear and tremble of whose glory the heavens and the earth are full. This is to discern the body of the Lord in accordance with the admonition of the Apostle. We should venerate the greatness of the mystery rather than to curiously investigate its truth by idle inquiry. So just again to summarise, the first thing we must do before receiving to, in order to prepare our soul is to believe in the real presence, to believe in all those three mysteries that we looked at in the last video. We must firmly believe those things. Another very necessary preparation is to ask ourselves if we are at peace with and sincerely love our neighbour. If therefore, this is quoting our Lord, thou offerest thy gift at the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath anything against thee, leave there thy offering before the altar, and go first to be reconciled to thy brother, and then coming thou shalt offer thy gift. That's from Matthew 5 verses 23 to 24. We should in the next place carefully examine whether our, our consciences be defiled by mortal sin. So an examination of conscience, which has to, uh, of sin, uh, to determine whether we have committed mortal sin and which must be repented of in order that it may be blotted out before communion by the remedy of contrition and confession. So then the best thing would be to go always go to confession uh, before the uh, the mass before receiving the host the council of trent has defined that no one that no one conscious of mortal sin and having an opportunity of going to confession however contrite he may deem himself is to approach the holy eucharist until he has been purified by sacramental confession and how to go to confession and what the entire sacrament of penance uh, is about we look at in the next the next video we should also reflect in the silence of our own hearts how unworthy we are that the Lord should bestow on us this divine gift. And with, this, with the centurion, of whom our Lord declared that he found not so great faith in Israel, we should exclaim from our hearts, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst enter under my roof. Matthew 8, 8. We should also put the question to ourselves whether we can truly say with Peter, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. John 21 verses 15 to 17 and should recollect that he who sat down at the banquet of the Lord without a wedding garment that's from one of Christ's parables was cast into a dark dungeon and condemned to eternal torments Matthew 22 verses 11 to 14 preparation of body our preparation should not however be confined to the soul it should also extend to the body we are to approach the holy table fasting having neither eaten nor drunk uh, nor drunk anything at least from the preceding midnight until the moment of communion. Now that is what it was like at the time of the Council of Trent. Uh, the church has given various instructions concerning the fast. Uh, one of the other practices was to fast three hours before another one more recent was one hour before. But uh, traditionally it was always uh, from preceding midnight all the way until receiving so no breakfast <laughs> um, until afterwards the dignity of so great a sacrament also demands that married persons abstain from the marriage debt for some days previous to communion this observance is recommended by the example of david 
who, when about to receive the showbread from the hands of the priest, declared that he and his servants had been clean from women for three days. First Samuel 21, verses 4 to 5. The above are the principal things to be done by the faithful preparatory to receiving the sacred mysteries with profit, and to these heads may be reduced whatever other things may seem desirable by way of preparation. So, once again, to summarise, preparation of the body and of the soul before receiving communion. The obligation of communion. How often must communion be received? Lest any be kept away from communion by the fear that the requisite preparation is too hard and laborious, the faithful are frequently to be reminded that they are all bound to receive the Holy Eucharist. Furthermore, the Church has decreed that whoever neglects to approach Holy Communion once a year, at Easter, is liable to sentence of excommunication. So communion must be received at least once a year at Easter time. The Eucharist desires the faithful to communicate daily. However, let not the faithful imagine that it is enough to receive the body of our Lord once a year only, in obedience to the decree of the Church. They should approach more often. But whether monthly, weekly or daily cannot be decided by any fixed universal rule. St. Augustine, however, lays down a most certain norm. Live in such a manner as to be able to receive every day. So even if you can't receive every day, live in such a way uh, so that you would be able to receive. It will therefore be the duty of the pastor frequently to admonish the faithful that, as they deem it necessary to afford daily nutriment or nourishment to the body, they should also feel solicitous to feed and nourish the soul every day with this heavenly food. It is clear that the soul stands not less in need of spiritual than the body of corporal food. Here it will be found most useful to recall the inestimable and divine advantages which, as we have already shown, flow from sacramental communion. It will be well also to refer to the manna, which was a figure or a type of this sacrament and which refreshed the bodily powers every day. The fathers who earnestly recommended the frequent reception of the sacrament may also be cited. The words of St. Augustine, Thou sinnest daily, receive daily, express not his opinion only, but that of all the fathers who have written on the subject, as any one may easily discover who will carefully read them. That there was a time when the faithful approached Holy Communion every day, we learn from the Acts of the Apostles. All who then professed the faith of Christ burned with such true and sincere charity that, devoting themselves to prayer and other works of piety, they were found prepared to communicate daily. This devout practice, which seems to have been interrupted for a time, was again partially revived by the Holy Pope and Martyr Anacletus, who commanded that all the ministers who assisted at the sacrifice of the Mass should communicate an ordinance, as the pontiff declares of apostolic institution. It was also for a long time the practice of the Church that, as soon as the sacrifice was complete, and when the priest himself had communicated, that is, received communion, he turned to the congregation and invited the faithful to the holy table in these words, Come, brethren, and receive communion. And thereupon those who were prepared advanced to receive the holy mysteries with the most fervent devotion. The Church commands the faithful to communicate once a year. But, subsequently, when charity and devotion had grown so cold that the faithful very seldom approached communion, it was decreed by Pope Fabian that all should communicate thrice every year, at Christmas, at Easter, and at Pentecost. This decree was afterwards confirmed by many councils, particularly by the first of Agdi. Such, at length, was the decay of piety, that not only was this holy and salutary law unobserved, but communion was deferred for years. So the Council of Lateran therefore decreed that all the faithful should receive the sacred body of the Lord at least once a year, at Easter, and that neglect of this duty should be chastised by exclusion from the society of the faithful. Excommunication. Those who are obliged by, law, uh, of com by the law of communion. But although this law, sanctioned by the authority of God and of his church, concerns all the faithful, it should be taught that it does not extend to those who, on account of their tender age, have not attained the use of reason. So it only applies for those who have attained the age of reason. Um, and onwards. For these are not able to distinguish the Holy Eucharist from common and ordinary bread and cannot bring with them to the sacrament piety and devotion. Furthermore, to extend the precept to them, would appear inconsistent with the ordinance of our Lord. For he said, take and eat, words which cannot apply to infants, 
who are evidently incapable of taking and eating. In some places, it is true, an ancient practice prevailed of giving the Holy Eucharist even to infants, but for the reasons already assigned and for other reasons in keeping with Christian piety, this practice has long since been discontinued by authority of the Church. With regard to the age at which children should be given the Holy Mysteries, this the parents and confessor can best determine. To them it belongs to inquire and to ascertain from the children themselves whether they have some knowledge of this admirable sacrament and whether they desire to receive it. That is very important because this is not happening in most countries today, especially in Ireland. It's just part of the, the school system that when they're eight years old, seven or eight in second class, they just learn to... Uh, they just prepare to receive Holy Communion. However, here it clearly says it is for the priest and the parents, uh, or the parents and the confessor more specifically, to determine whether a child is ready to receive and the child itself must desire it. So, yeah, so these are all things that should really be reconsidered if we want to restore true faith uh, to the faith and faith in Christ uh, for future generations. Communion must not be given to persons who are insane. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, the word insane, a bit old fashioned here. Probably mentally unstable, I think, would be the more politically correct term to use. Um, and incapable of devotion. However, according to the decree of the Council of Carthage, it may be administered to them at the close of life, provided they have shown before losing their minds a pious and religious disposition and no danger arising from the state of the stomach or other inconvenience or disrespect is likely. The right of administering communion. As to the right to be, uh, sorry, that's right with R-I-T-E, so as in, in, in ritual or ceremony, not the right as in a privilege. Um, uh, as, uh, as to the right to be observed in communicating, pastors should teach that the law of the Holy Church forbids communion under both kinds to anyone but the officiating priests, um, without the authority of the church itself. So of both kinds then refers to bread and wine. So only priests, according to the council, according to the church, are permitted to receive both uh, the bread, uh, sorry, uh, communion under the species of bread and wine. Um, anyone but the official priest without the authority, unless the authority of the church decrees, decrees or allows otherwise. Christ the Lord, it is true, as has been explained by the Council of Trent, instituted and delivered to his apostles at his last supper, this most sublime sacrament under the species of bread and wine. But it does not follow that by doing so, our Lord and Saviour established a law ordering its administration to all the faithful under both species. For speaking of this sacrament, he himself frequently mentions it under one kind only, as for instance, when he says, If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And also, the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world, and he that eateth this bread shall live forever. Again from John chapter 6 verses 52 and 59 specifically. Why the celebrant, that is the priest or the, the bishop, whoever is, is leading, leading the, uh, doing the consecration, why the celebrant alone receives under both species. It is clear that the church was influenced by numerous and most cogent reasons, not only to approve but also to confirm by authority of its decree the general practice of communicating under one species. In the first place, the greatest caution was necessary to avoid spilling the blood of the Lord on the ground, a thing that seemed not easily to be avoided if the chalice were administered in a large assemblage of the people. In the next place, whereas the Holy Eucharist ought to be in readiness for the sick, it was very much to be apprehended were the species of wine to remain long unconsumed, that it might turn acid. Besides, there are many who cannot at all bear the taste or even the smell of wine. Lest, therefore, what is intended for the spiritual health should prove hurtful to the health of the body, it has been most prudently provided by the Church that it should be administered to the people under the species of bread only. The main reasons again it gives here is because due to the time, the amount of time that it would take to give all the all the faithful in the congregation, um, the bread and the wine. Uh, the, here it says that um, the the if the if, if the wine is is left unconsumed for too long, it might turn acid. Uh, the other the other reason was that some people just can't can't take wine. 
and they don't they don't like the the, the smell or the taste of it so again it was really with regards to consideration of of the congregation the church has decreed uh, it is just more more prudent that everyone receives the species of bread only now there are some exceptions um, especially at at uh, at marriages the the the, the 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 couple receives under both under both species but again that is an exception um we may also further observe that in many countries wine is extremely scarce nor can it moreover be brought from er elsewhere without incurring very heavy expenses and encountering very tedious and difficult journeys okay that's more specifically uh, for the context of council of trend times nowadays we can uh it's it's more easy to get to get wine and and alcohol than to actually uh, attend mass in some places um well in, in ireland everywhere now since we're on level three of this of this lockdown but anyway that's another another topic for another day finally a most important reason was the necessity of opposing the heresy of those who denied that christ holland and tyre is contained under either species and asserted that the body is contained under the species of bread without the blood and the blood under the species of wine without the body in order therefore to place more clearly before the eyes of all the truth of the catholic faith communion under one kind that is under the species of bread was most wisely introduced so again to underline the point that even if uh, we only receive bread we're also receiving the blood because in the in the in the body of christ the blood so in divinity is also present and in the blood of christ the body so in divinity is present so to receive one is to receive both there are also other reasons collected by those who have treated on this subject and which, if it shall appear necessary, can be brought forward by pastors. So, moving on then to the minister of the Eucharist, who are the ones who minister it. To omit nothing doctrinal on this sacrament, we now come to speak of its minister, a point, however, on which scarcely anyone can be ignorant. Only priests have power to consecrate and administer the Eucharist. It must be taught, then, that to priests alone has been given power to consecrate and administer to the faithful the Holy Eucharist. That this has been and the unwavering practice of the Church, that the faithful should receive the sacrament from the priests, and that the officiating priests should communicate themselves, has been explained by the Holy Council of Trent, which has also shown that this practice, as having proceeded from apostolic tradition, is to be religiously retained, particularly as Christ the Lord has left us an illustrious example thereof, having consecrated his own most sacred body and given it to the apostles with his own hands. So similarly, as Christ consecrated uh, the hosts with his own hands, he administered it using those hands, and similarly should also be the case with the priest who consecrates the host. Okay, now there may be some questions arising there with regards to extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. Um, that is also a topic for another day. However, the traditional position based on the Council of Trent is quite clear that only the priest has the power to consecrate and administer the Eucharist. Good, so let us move on. The laity are prohibited to touch the sacred vessels. To safeguard in every possible way the dignity of so august a sacrament, not only is the power of its administration entrusted exclusively to priests, but the Church also has prohibited by law any but consecrated persons, unless some case of great necessity intervene, to dare handle or touch the sacred vessels, the linen or other instruments necessary to its completion. Priests themselves and the rest of the faithful may hence understand how great should be the piety and holiness of those who approach to consecrate, administer or receive the Eucharist. The unworthiness of the minister does not invalidate the sacrament. Okay, so this is a topic we touched on uh, briefly as well back in when we were looking at the articles of the Apostles' Creed, uh, when we were looking at the Catholic Church in particular, and that uh, the Church always maintains its pure uh, form regardless of the members who may be good or who may be wicked. So the unworthiness of the minister does not invalidate the sacrament. So even if we have a priest who is a wicked man who does who commits great sins privately um, or publicly whatever 
the consecration is still valid. Now he will meet his he, he will meet his maker and he will be brought to justice at the end of his life. But as he, as he is an ordained priest uh, who consecrates the host in accordance with with church teaching, uh, the, the, the host is uh, still validly consecrated. What, however, has been already said of the other sacraments holds good also with regard to the sacrament of the Eucharist, namely that a sacrament is validly administered even by the wicked, provided all the essentials have been duly observed. For we are to believe that all these depend not on the merit of the minister, but are operated by the virtue and power of Christ our Lord. These are the things necessary to be explained regarding the Eucharist as a sacrament. So moving on then, the Eucharist as a sacrifice, because we refer to it as the holy sacrifice of the Mass. We must now proceed to explain its nature as a sacrifice, that pastors may understand what are the principal instructions which they ought to impart to the faithful on Sundays and holy days, regarding this mystery in conformity with the decree of the Holy Council of Trent. Importance of instruction on the Mass. This sacrament is not only a treasure of heavenly riches, which if turned to good account, will obtain for us the grace and love of God, but it also possesses a peculiar character, by which we are enabled to make some return to God for the immense benefits bestowed upon us. How grateful and acceptable to God is this victim, if duly and legitimately immolated, is inferred from the following consideration. Of the sacrifices of the old law it is written, Sacrifice and oblation thou wouldst not. Psalm 39.7 and again, if thou hadst desired sacrifice, I would indeed have given it. With burnt offerings thou wilt not be delighted. And that is from the famous Psalm 50, the Miserere, also Psalm 51, sometimes in some Christian denominations, also referred to as the sinner's prayer. Uh, but in, in, in Catholic teaching, we refer to it as the Miserere, the have mercy on us, O Lord. Now, if these were so pleasing in the Lord's sight that, as the scripture testifies, from them God smelled a sweet savour, that is to say, they were grateful and acceptable to him, what have we not to hope from that sacrifice in which is immolated and offered he himself, of whom a voice from heaven twice proclaimed, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And the two times that God the Father expressed that in relation to Christ the Son was at the baptism baptism in the Jordan, Matthew 3.17, and also at the Transfiguration, Matthew 17, verse 5. This mystery, therefore, pastors should carefully explain, so that when the faithful are assembled at the celebration of divine service, they may learn to meditate with attention and devotion on the sacred things at which they are present. Distinction of Sacrament and Sacrifice they should teach, then, in the first place, that the Eucharist was instituted by Christ for two purposes. One, that it might be the heavenly food of our souls, enabling us to support and preserve spiritual life. And the other, that the Church might have a perpetual sacrifice, by which our sins might be expiated and our Heavenly Father, oftentimes grievously offended by our crimes, might be turned away from wrath to mercy, from the severity of just chastisement to clemency. Of this thing we may observe a type and resemblance in the paschal lamb, from Exodus 12, which was wont to be offered and eaten by the children of Israel as a sacrament and a sacrifice. And I mentioned that briefly in the previous video. Nor could our Saviour, when about to offer himself to God the Father on the altar of the cross, have given any more illustrious indication of his unbounded love towards us than by bequeathing to us a visible sacrifice, by which that bloody sacrifice, which was soon after to be offered once on the cross, would be renewed, and its memory daily celebrated, with the greatest utility, unto the consummation of ages, by the Church diffused throughout the world. So this is important to understand that at every Mass we're not re-sacrificing Christ, so we're not physically killing Christ at the Mass, but... We, be, um, we are present at that sacrifice, at the sacrifice on Calvary. We are brought mystically to that moment and we participate in it. Um, yeah, we participate and we receive as Christ gave his body and blood to the apostles. So then we are brought to that moment as well and receive. But between the Eucharist as a sacrament and a sacrifice, the difference is very great. As a sacrament, it is perfected by consecration. 
So it is complete then. The sacrament is complete once the consecration has been completed. The sacrifice, all its force consists in its oblation. So that is in the in the giving out of it. When, therefore, kept in a pix or born to the sick, it is a sacrament and not a sacrifice. As a sacrament also, it is to them that uh, receive it a source of merit and brings with it all those advantages which have been already mentioned. But as a sacrifice, it is not only a source of merit, but also of satisfaction. For as in his passion, Christ the Lord merited and satisfied for us, so also those who offer this sacrifice, by which they communicate with us, merit the fruit of his passion and satisfy. So again, we are participating with Christ. We're not just commemorating an event that happened 2,000 years ago, almost 2,000 years ago, but we are also brought to that moment and we are participating uh, with him. Okay, so the Mass is a true sacrifice. Proof from the Council of Trent. With regard to the institution of this sacrifice, the Holy Council of Trent has left no room for doubt by declaring that it was instituted by our Lord at his Last Supper. While it condemns under anathema, that is under uh, eternal condemnation, of those, all those who assert that in it is not offered to God a true and proper sacrifice, or that to offer means nothing else than that Christ is given as our spiritual food. Nor did the council omit carefully to explain that to God alone is offered this sacrifice. For although the church sometimes offers masses in honour and in memory of the saints, Yet she teaches that the sacrifice is offered, not to them, but to God alone, who has crowned the saints with immortal glory. Hence the priest never says, I offer sacrifice to thee, Peter, or to thee, Paul. But while he offers sacrifice to God alone, he renders him thanks for the signal victory won by the blessed martyrs, and thus implores their patronage, and they whose memory we celebrate on earth may vouchsafe to intercede for us in heaven. Very good. And so that is proof from the Council of Trent. Now we move to proof from Scripture that the, the Mass is a, is a true sacrifice. This doctrine handed down by the Catholic Church concerning the truth of this sacrifice she received from the words of our Lord. When on that last night, committing to his apostles these same sacred mysteries, he said, do this for a commemoration of me. Luke twenty two nineteen, also 1 Corinthians 11, verses 24 to 25. For then, as was defined by the Holy Council, he ordained them priests and commanded that they and their successors in the priestly office should immolate and offer his body. Again, important point to remember at the Last Supper, the apostles who remained Judas. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, no. At the at the at the Last Supper, the apostles were were ordained. They were all ordained priests, um, bishops, more specifically, and they themselves then had the authority to. Uh, pass that uh, the apostolic session, succession on to their chosen successors. So they then had the authority to ordain priests and bishops after them. Of this the words of the apostle to the Corinthians also afford a sufficient proof. You cannot drink the chalice of the Lord and the chalice of devils. You cannot be partakers of the table of the Lord and of the table of devils. 1 Corinthians 10.21 as then by the table of devils must be understood the altar on which sacrifice was offered to them, so also if the conclusion proposed to himself by the apostle is to be legitimately drawn, by the table of the Lord can be understood nothing else than the altar on which sacrifice was offered to the Lord. Should we look for figures and prophecies for this sacrifice in the Old Testament? In the first place, Malachi most clearly prophesied thereof in these words. From the rising of the sun even to the going down, my name is great among the Gentiles. And in every place there is sacrifice, and there is offered to my name a clean oblation. For my name is great among the Gentiles, saith the Lord of hosts. Malachi 1.11 Moreover, this victim was foretold, as well before as after the promulgation of the law, by various kinds of sacrifices. For this victim alone, as the perfection completion of all, comprises all the blessings which were signified by the other sacrifices. In nothing, however, do we behold a more lively image of the Eucharistic sacrifice than in that of Melchizedek. For the Saviour himself offered to God the Father, at his last supper, his body and blood, under the appearances of bread and wine, 
declaring that he was constituted a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 109 verse 4 in the Dewey Reims 110 and other translations that is also frequently quoted and referenced in the epistle to the Hebrews, especially chapters 5 to 7. And Melchizedek himself appears all the way back in Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 to 20, where he is described as a priest king who brings out bread and wine. The excellence of the Mass. The Mass is the same sacrifice as that of the cross. That is important. We therefore confess that the sacrifice of the Mass is and ought to be considered one and the same sacrifice as that of the cross. For the victim is one and the same, namely Christ our Lord, who offered himself once only a bloody sacrifice on the altar of the cross. The bloody and unbloody victim are not two, but one victim only, whose sacrifice is daily renewed in the Eucharist. In obedience to the command of our Lord, do this for a commemoration of me. The priest is also one and the same, Christ the Lord. For the ministers who offer sacrifice consecrate the holy mysteries not in their own person, but in that of Christ, as the words of consecration itself show. For the priest does not say, this is the body of Christ, but this is my body, and thus acting in the person of Christ the Lord, we refer to that as being in persona Christi, he changes the substance of the bread and wine into the true substance of his body and blood. The Mass, a sacrifice of praise, thanksgiving and propitiation. This being the case, it must be taught without any hesitation that, as the Holy Council of Trent has also explained, the sacred and holy sacrifice of the Mass is not a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving only, or a mere commemoration of the sacrifice performed on the cross, but also truly a propitiatory sacrifice by which God is appeased and rendered propitious to us. If, therefore, with a pure heart, a lively faith, and affected with an inward sorrow for our transgressions, we immolate and offer this most holy victim, we shall without doubt obtain mercy from the Lord, and grace in time of need. For so delighted is the Lord with the door of this victim, that, bestowing on us the gift of grace and repentance, he pardons our sins. Hence this usual prayer of the Church. As often as the commemoration of this victim is celebrated, so often is the work of our salvation being done. That is to say, through this unbloody sacrifice flow to us the most plenteous fruits of that bloody victim. The Mass profits both the living and the dead. Pastor should next teach that such is the efficacy of the sacrifice, that it benefits ex its benefits extend not only to the celebrant and communicant, but to all the faithful, whether living with us on earth or already numbered with those who are dead in the Lord but whose sins have not yet been fully expiated. So those would be the souls in purgatory. For according to the most authentic apostolic tradition, it is not less available when offered for them than when offered for the sins of the living, their punishments, satisfactions, calamities and difficulties of every sort. It is hence easy to perceive that all masses, as being conducive to the common interest and salvation of all the faithful, are to be considered common to all. And that is why Masses are said uh, for the faithful departed. The Rites and Ceremonies of the Mass The sacrifice of the Mass is celebrated with many solemn rites and ceremonies, none of which should be deemed useless or superfluous. On the contrary, all of them tend to display the majesty of this august sacrifice and to excite the faithful, when beholding these saving mysteries, to con contemplate the divine things which lie concealed in the Eucharistic sacrifice. On these rites and ceremonies we shall not dwell, since they require a more lengthy exposition than is compatible with the nature of the present work. Moreover, priests can easily consult on this subject some of the many booklets and works that have been written by pious learned men that are concerns literature um, regarding the, the Mass and the different parts of the Mass and all the, the vestments and uh, vessels that are used. What has been said so far will, with the divine assistance, be found sufficient to explain the principal things with regard to the Holy Eucharist, both as a sacrament and sacrifice. Very good. So that is it for the Eucharist. Next we'll move on to the Sacrament of Penance, which is also quite a substantial chapter. So that may also very well be divided into three or maybe even four different parts just to keep each video 
concise. Um, very good. So we'll leave it at that for today. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you found this section useful and I do look forward to seeing you in the next video. So take care and God bless.